Ah, good morning on a Wednesday morning. This is Dave Fidel. We're doing business in Hawaii today with Donny Shimamoto. He joins us from the West Coast. He's a CPA, but he's very high tech. Hi, Donny. Hi, Jay. Nice to be here. <laughs> yeah, thanks for coming. Well, I want to talk to you about your your practice because your practice is not the uh, you know the ordinary run of the mill CPA practice. It goes beyond that, and maybe it's a statement of the future. Can you tell us why your practice differs from the conventional CPA practice? Sure. I, I like to think of my practice as the next generation practice, and it's really representative. I normally call myself a non-traditional CPA because I don't do audit, tax, or bookkeeping. My background is actually in audit, but I actually do technology advisory services. And what that really means is that we help our clients make better decisions around technology and their use of technology, particularly in their businesses. Ah, so, so there's two things happening here. One is you're using technology, which I wanna cover in some detail on this discussion. Mm -hmm. And the other is you're consulting with your clients about their use of technology. Yeah, right. that's very important because a lot of clients, you know, are Luddites. They should have an <laughs> L for their middle name, Luddite, yeah? So let's talk about that one first. You know, what do you find out there in, in, the, in the CPA community, the client community? Are people knowledgeable about this or no? I think there's a pretty wide variety. And, you know, one of the things that I find interesting is a lot of people go, well, with the millennials coming in, that, hey, I just grab a millennial, stick them in the workforce, throw some technology at them, and they'll fix all of our problems. And I'm one of the ones sitting there going, no, don't do that. You know, business technology and the way all of the different systems interact really is takes some knowledge and it takes an understanding of business processes. And when we bring the accounting context in there, it takes an, also an understanding of internal controls or how do I stop someone from um, committing fraud or how do I ensure that, you know, I have data I can rely upon. And that's where the CPA mindset starts to come in. Well, that's very, it's really interesting you say that because I, I, so many people say, oh, you're a millennial. And, and by the way, millennials, anybody young, it doesn't really matter. If they, if they had a cherubic right. look around them, they, they must be a millennial. And if they're a millennial, they must know about technology. And if they must know about technology, they're a natural for my business. They can figure it all out. All I have to do is unleash them and it will just be fine. But that's not true. No. So how do you Completely. get a millennial, you know, a cherubic millennial who has been doing you know, social media and games all his life or her life? Uh, to be a business, a business computer person, how do you make, how do you get them to make that transition? Well, that that's actually part of what uh, my firm does. That's also different. So the reason I'm actually on the West Coast right now is uh, my firm is based in Hawaii. We're a Hawaii CPA firm formed formed in Hawaii. I was I'm a University of Hawaii grad, and but what I'm having to do is I'm having to actually travel to educate people how to do this. So I spend over uh, over half the time of the year um, traveling around the mainland, speaking in different states and uh, within the last couple of years, also internationally to really help people understand this is the business aspects of technology. And this these are these are both the innovations that can help move us forward, as well as here are some of the cybersecurity and other types of things we have to worry about as we look at a foundation to ensure everything is secure. Yeah. So here you have a millennial bright eyed. Um, very familiar with social media, spends, you know, uh, 18 hours a day on social media and uh, knows how to work that phone really, really fast. Um, <laughs> but he doesn't know too much about business uh, programming and software. Well, how do you start that conversation? What do you say to him? Look, you know, you, you got to come to another level. Here are the things you yeah. need to know. What are the things he needs to know or she? The, the first thing I always say is start with the business purpose. Because a lot of times what you'll see, and this is not just in millennials, but this is a lot of the vendors, they're coming to you with a solution that's looking for a problem. And a lot of times I come back to it and I'm like, well, wait, what is the business problem that we're trying to solve? We really need to start there and understand also what is the strategy 
for the organization? What's the business strategy? What are we trying to achieve? So those are normally the first things we really start to come at and say, well, how is this going to either add value in really being able to help us to do something, or how is this also potentially going to add risk? And so I need to do something to secure it, or I need to make sure that I'm understanding the potential impacts to the business if this technology is not available. Like think about like ransomware. That's one of the ones now where if you've got ransomware, it'll lock down your systems. And how do you deal with that? And if you've built your business and being dependent upon this system, have you mitigated the risks associated with that? You no, know, it's uh, it's so interesting. It's like um, uh, it's like um, a dog training class. I'll tell you why I say that. Because when you have dog training class, you're not only training the dog, you're training the master. You're training a whole new paradigm between them, a relationship where the icons, you know, of of, of knowledge, of um, of programming, of of expectation are all different, but they both have to get on board. Am I right? You're completely right. And that's when we look at the success factors for whether technology or innovation as a whole is being incorporated in. It takes that buy-in from the very top, that CEO or business owner coming in and saying, okay, I understand that this is technology, this is how it'll help our business. And then them also coming in and allowing the other, the millennial or whoever it is, because a lot of times I'll tell you too, it's, it's not the millennial, it's the Gen X or maybe that understands the business is in a management position and is in a well position to say, well, this is how we can use that technology to really come in and help. And so it's really about buy-in and adoption. And uh, that actually, you know, interestingly, I gave you my background. I'm, I'm actually a CPA by training. Uh, I'm an IT specialist within our CPA realm. And then I've also done some graduate work in organizational development around behavioral change and organizational psychology, because ah. it's that adoption of the technology and that change in thinking that's required to really get the benefits. Yeah, I, 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 all three of those go together, you know, and it's, uh, what do they call it now? It's uh, called uh, network, uh, network analysis, uh, social network analysis. It preceded mm -hmm. uh, Facebook, it preceded social media. And it is the, mm -hmm. the concept that actually the uh, NSA started using after 9-11, where you take the email of a given organization and you analyze it for keywords, and then you make another schematic, a whole new schematic of who's really running the place, a social network yeah. analysis. And it, it has been yeah. used, it is used today, and you're using it, I guess, in corporations to find out who, in fact, is in charge. It's very important. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it is. That That's one of the great uses of artificial intelligence as well, is it'll tell you who the real people are. Yeah. Well, uh, before we go to that, and I do want to go to that, I want to catch on one thing you said, and, and that's uh, security and ransomware and all the other dangers and risks and threats and pitfalls of, of nasties that are out there watching you and trying to do either mischief or or, or kidnapping, as the case may be. Um, so you yeah. have to help people because you know their lives and fortunes, their businesses in general are completely you know dependent on, on being clear of those threats. Um, but those mm -hmm. threats change every day. Therefore, you must change, you must follow it. Uh, so my first question in that regard is how do you follow something that is moving so fast you know, that the average Joe has no idea how fast it's moving? How do you follow it? That, that really, I think, is a misconception. So I won't say that it's not evolving. It is evolving. It, it does evolve quite a bit. But most people are not subject or as much at risk to these, these first day attacks or these latent attacks that are really coming in. What we can do, though, is we can prepare and be ready to respond. And so really, it's about making sure that you understand where are the threat vectors to your organization? Where are the threats potentially coming? You know, and, and with that, I'll mention, if you look at Ponymon's research, they do a study every year around the data breaches. You know, only 50% of those uh, incidences are coming because it's this outside hacker trying to come in and get into your network. And everyone thinks, well, that's who it is and I'm never gonna stop them, right? Because exactly what you said, it's like everything's changing so fast, how can I even stay ahead? It's really only 50%. Another 25% of the attacks are really coming from an employee simply making a mistake, clicking on the wrong link, opening the wrong attachment, you know, that ends up giving up their password or launching the ransomware attack. That, those threats are combated through user awareness and 
helping them understand these are how you identify links that you shouldn't be clicking on. This is how you make sure you don't click on something or open up a file that you shouldn't be opening. You know, those are kind of the simple things. That's another 25%. And then the last 25% is really about IT or business processes not being designed correctly. And so that again is making sure that you have competent IT team or you're working with a competent IT provider, as well as making sure that your systems are designed in a way where whether it's social security numbers, bank routing numbers, credit card numbers, that they're not exposed as they're moving through your systems or through your transactional processes. So 50% or half of the incidences that cause a data breach, you can actually protect your business from. Well, that, that uh, reminds me of the uh, false missile crisis back two years ago. I'm sure you followed that. Uh, and it was a, a, a particular employee uh, working for uh, the organization that handled the warnings. Um, and it was a question of training. It was a question of the authority. It was a question of the, the protocols, the programming. Uh, all, all those things seem, seem to have gone wrong. And in your discussion a minute ago, it sounded like if you followed the steps you were outlining, that would not have happened. And so, uh, but, but the lesson to me is that you can have a perfectly innocent situation where somebody just isn't up to snuff, where the programming isn't up to snuff, um, where it hasn't been thought through. And because of the leverage you get in computer programming and software now, uh, going to uh, mission critical operations by the company, uh, you can have a huge result for a tiny, tiny slip of the wrist mistake. So this is very important what you're saying. You could bring exactly. the whole the whole enchilada could come down one little tiny mistake. <laughs> yeah, and so the, um, that I was going to say that that's one of the things too, though that that whole fear of that little thing right coming through. That's what you see a lot of IT professionals using as leverage, and they'll come in with these dark web reports and these other things saying, "Hey, uh, you need to be careful. Here's all the things that are floating on the dark web." But in the end, it's not about absolutely minimizing that risk it's really about managing that risk. And that's that perspective that we come at as CPAs. What are the risks out there? How do we manage and mitigate those risks to something that's manageable and acceptable by the business? Right, but we don't panic. And we don't, right. we don't go too far, too hard, too fast and worry about it all night long. It's a, yes, yep. I, I totally agree. And, and that takes me to the next question I have for you, which I think you yeah. knew I was gonna ask you, and that is coronavirus. You know, we are sitting in a world that is changing around us. Uh, some people say by the hour, other people say by the minute. Uh, Angela Merkel, uh, you know, this morning predicted that two thirds of the German population would be infected soon enough. There are other scientists, you know, based on, you know, what scientific, uh, scientific analysis uh, believe that we'll have millions of cases over the next few months in this country. So the question I, I put to you is you have clientele out there they have important businesses, they have employees who are at risk, they have management who's at risk, and they have an ongoing you know, threat, a threat that might get, is getting more deadly every day. Uh, they must ask you uh, what to do. What do you tell them now, today, Wednesday? What do you tell them? So luckily, a lot of our, our clients uh, are coming to us because they've already anticipated these types of incidences. And this actually falls into the area of business continuity planning. And some people will call it disaster recovery because uh, really it's, I mean, it is a disaster. We can't leave our homes, right? We're isolating ourselves. Then it, it is a disaster. Uh, so what we're really looking at here is how do we enable business processes to either be conducted remotely mm. or that they can be automated, right? And so they can be conducted without a human interve intervention. So depending upon the industry and of course, depending upon the type of systems that are that a company is using, that's where these business continuity plans are gonna vary and they're gonna be different. Yeah, so so you come into a situation and you, you know, I'm, I'm sure you have this experience and I'm sure you're, you've, been, you've been through it. Um, come into a, a firm, a new firm, a new client, new client, but a client that's been around for a while, a client that has some legs and you walk through the place and you see they got, they got computers that are 20 years old, they got software that isn't supported uh, and they're, they're dealing with a, you know, a, a mindset that doesn't have any significant expectation for moving ahead. And so mm -hmm. now you, you're meeting with the uh, with executive committee and you know, which, what's on your mind is these guys are way behind the curve and they're gonna have to spend some real money to get, to get 
even to a reasonable place, much less an advanced place. What do you say to them? Now that, that'll call on psychology. I mean, maybe you need a degree in psychology too, you know, a psychological CPA person. Anyway, what do you say to them? That, that you know what, that is exactly where it comes to. A lot of it is about, uh, I actually think of it as hope, right? And so there's all these things happening. I don't know what's going on. And so it's actually one of the way we describe what we do is we provide vision and clarity. So our typical client, when we're coming in, it's my question is, tell me where you want to be three to five years from now. And we create that vision over on that side that says, okay, this is where you want to be. If this is where you want to be three to five years from now, let's look at all these steps that we can take you to go along the way to reach that vision. And that's how we take this big mass of, we have to update all these things and break it down and say, okay, now let's figure out what can fit in your budget. What's going to make sense. Let's step you along and create this roadmap. And it may be a mix of different products. It may be a changing in systems. Sometimes it's just changing in the way that you operate business processes and procedures. And, uh, but that, that's kind of the core of our approach. Now we're going to take a, a short break. When we come back, I would like to discuss with you, you know, what the ideal arrangement would be. I know that's a very broad question. Um, and what you would like to see them ask you for, <laughs> what you would like to see them ask you for. I also want to ask you about the distinction between, you know, profit businesses, ordinary corporations, LLCs and the like, and nonprofits when it comes to your special kind of practice. We'll be right back. Don Ishimamoto. All right, we're back with Donnie Shimamoto here on uh, Business in Hawaii on a given Wednesday on ThinkTech. I'm Jay Fidel. And my next question, which Donnie already knows what it is, is he's sitting there in the room with a bunch of management guys who have a 20-year-old system, and he's trying to bring them current and get them to see into the future even, maybe use that future examination, um, the ghost of Christmas future, if you will, uh, as a way to get them off the dime. But they may be Luddites, Donnie. If they're Luddites, you have to offer them options. You have to give them the vision. So what kind of vision do you give them? What do you tell them they should be asking you for? It's interesting that you, you frame it that way because we actually would not work with a client. <laughs> if, if they're at that point where they're like, we don't know, we don't believe in it, then we're, we're like, thank you. It's really great talking to you. You're not the client for us. Uh, we're, we're really here to help those that are buying into the technology and that see value in it move forward and accelerate their own success. Okay, well, let me go to this then. What kind of, what kind of mm, two to five year plans do you usually get? What do they usually say to you? Where, where do they say they think they want to go? Most of the time, it's, it's really figuring out how do you better leverage technology. And so whether it's onto, quote, the cloud, right, and how do I actually move my processes to the cloud, or it's how do I increase the interactions, the digital interactions with my customers. So whether it's online shopping, online customer support, or email-based support, or how do I, the other one more internally focused is how do I actually make everything work together? How do I get information that's in this system going into that system so I don't have someone manually rekeying things? So that's where we'll bring all whatever technologies are potentially available and talk them through and say, well, this is what's possible. And then we actually, from there, help them find all of the vendors that might make sense. So a lot of times you can almost think of us as like a general contractor where we have this grand plan for what you want your business to look like, and we'll bring in all of the different specialists that then we'll do the cabinets and the flooring and the everything else to you know, make mm -hmm. everything work. Mm -hmm. But we make sure everything works. Together. Sounds like designing a bicycle. First, you need the frame. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, you make me think of an um, experience we had uh, in, um, in Hawaii uh, maybe five years ago uh, where the state government decided that, yes, it was way behind <clears throat> and the state government wanted to catch up. 
and it took certain steps. Uh, it hired a consultant who had had a lot of experience in um, in you know organizational computer networking and so forth from Washington. Mm -hmm. He was from GSA, as a matter of fact. Sonny Bugwalia was his name. Yeah. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> he found. He found after, you know, I, it was like a lot of money was spent by, by uh, the government and by mm, what do you call it, private, private industry partners in the project. He found that, yes, indeed, um, the state was way behind. And we already knew that, so that was not really helpful. Uh, then the question is what to do. Uh, and that means a lot of money. And so, you know, I, I asked you before, what happens if you're in a room of Luddites? What happens if you're in a room of state government? Where they, you know, they have a bureaucracy that'll choke a horse, and you can't get them yeah. to do anything or spend anything. Do you take that client? It depends. You know, it's, it's funny you mentioned that project. When I first heard that project, I was like, "Whoa, <laughs> good luck!" <laughs> and then I saw the vision that Sunny came up with, and I went, "Wow, that that's pretty amazing." You know, it it would be great. It would be great to see all the improvements in in government, and uh, but it comes down again to the people and it's about change and it's about helping people understand and buy in even more so in government, right? Because we've got the unions that are coming in and we've got people who um, stereotypically, I'm going to say that I know it's not all state workers, but stereotypically people think of state workers as, you know, I'm not going to change, I'm not going to do anything. And again, that was why I ended up doing some of the graduate work in, in the psychology area because it's about how do we introduce incentives for change or how do we help get buy-in to change? And it's that adoption that is probably the most uh, difficult. The other thing that I think is from the state perspective when we look at that is there's a lot of complexity and there's the need for allowing particular departments to really be able to operate on, your, on their own. And that's not only true in state government, it's also true in, in business where maybe if there's multiple departments or there's multiple divisions and they're having to work a little differently. And that's the type of flexibility that, you know, it's our jobs to bring in to understand how can I actually introduce flexibility and, and agility in a business while still maintaining internal controls and maintaining all of the information and data flows and integration. Yeah, well, and now I want to take you to one other kind of client, which I think is one of your favorite clients, and that is a nonprofit. Nonprofits are special animals. They have special management. They have you know, they have a whole different way of thinking because there's no real owners there. Um, and the managers are, you know, incentivized in a different way. And, and their missions are different. And, uh, you know, arguably it's, uh, it's altruism that drives them. It's, it's a different way of proceeding. So how, do you, how does it differ when you meet a room full of managers for a nonprofit instead of a government room or, or a, you know, or ordinary business company? Actually, it, it, I actually find it's a lot easier with nonprofits because of this focus on the endpoint customer, the outcome that they're trying to achieve. So that's where when we look at a nonprofit, it's really the motivation to help people. And I'd like to also think that that's the motivation that we're seeing in government, right? In the end, it's how do I serve the average citizen? How do I make a difference in people's lives? And so the psychology around that, again, comes into play. It's this motivation of, well, if we work together and we make this change, that's how we can achieve this lofty goal that we set or this vision that we're trying to achieve. You know, versus a lot of times in business, the problem we're going to see there is they'll, they'll become this question of, well, what's the impact of my profitability? And is it going to affect my profit sharing? Or is it going to affect my bonus right, if we don't make that? Versus in the nonprofit world and in the government world, we see this, well, in the end, if I have the funding and if I'm able to better serve my constituents or you know, the, the people that I'm trying to help, but then, I, then we should do it because then it makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and it seems to me that that's one of your favorite things. And it also seems to me that people in the nonprofit are, um, you know, they're trying to make the world a better place. And it's, they're not asking you, how soon are we going to recover our costs? Which is a, right. a deadly question, you know, because it's very hard to answer that. It's a prediction yeah. thing. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, I guess uh, we're a nonprofit and, uh, you know, we, we want to, here at ThinkTech, we want to have every new technology that we can possibly imagine. Uh, I don't think that's your average client. Uh, but suppose you run into a client like that who says, Donnie, we want it all. 
We want you, you do AI, we want to find out how AI is going to leverage every single thing we do. Uh, we want a database, we want to keep a record of everything and have it immediately available and so forth. Um, what do you say to that client? Because he has the risk of spending too much money on dreamlike things, you know, and aspirations that are largely theoretical. How do you stop him from doing that? Or do you stop him from doing that? It's, it's actually the same question that I started with in the beginning, right? So what is the business outcome or what are you trying to achieve? And can we actually align the technology or the thing that you saw at the last conference you went to, right? They, how do you how do we align that with achieving that vision? So we'll go through a little bit of validation there to make sure that we're managing expectations and that it really is contributing towards the objective. And that's again that that it's the decision making process. And I'm I'm here as a CPA to help my clients make better decisions around technology. So it's really thinking through that, going through the visualization because there's diagramming techniques that we can use to say you know this is what it really needs to look like when we get there. And then figuring out, you know, what are the steps? How do we, how do we ensure? And if they want to move fast, it's, hey, how do we get people behind this? Because the faster you move, or the bigger the project is, the more risk there is. And so we need to make sure that those things are managed appropriately. Well, last one, one last category. We only have a minute left, and that is the guy that says, "I don't care what it costs, honey. I do not care. I want to be at the front of the wave. I want to have the, I want to have the greatest leverage possible. I want to automate everything." This sounds like Jeff Bezos, doesn't it? Uh, I want to automate everything possible because I know that in the future this will, you know, be a big return for me. Not now, but later. And no, nobody cares how much later. But soon enough, we want to leverage. You know, we want to have the benefit of this leverage. What do you say to that client? Can you do that? Um, how do you do that? Is that a special effort for you? I'll tell you, I, I in all my years of practice, and I've been in practice for over twenty years now. I, I have never heard that. <laughs> <laughs> So I wish I could say there was a scenario for it. Um, we don't see it very often, or at you know at this point at all, because we we work primarily with small and mid-sized organizations, very much our you know our Hawaii business environment, and so we don't see that a ton. I will tell you though that when a client comes to me that has that type of mentality, because we've tried to work with some like startups, like that often is a recipe for failure, because what you're going to find is that they're going to say, well, I want all this today. And then they go and they read the next thing and they go, well, then I want that tomorrow. Oh, sure. and, and can you deliver it, you know, by the end of the week or tomorrow or yesterday? And uh, <laughs> those are actually red flags for us. To work you, can't chase, <laughs> you can't chase the rainbow every single day. <laughs> Donnie Shimamoto is an extraordinary CPA who's into so many things, including technology for everything in your business or your nonprofit or even your government organization. Thank you so much for joining us, Donnie. Thank you, Jay. I appreciate you having me on the show. Aloha.